Buongiorno a tutti, mi chiamo Andrea Moro e ho l'immeritato e immenso onore di presentare al pubblico del Festival della Letteratura di Mantova Noam Chomsky. Mi rifiuto di presentarlo perché Noam è una figura leader nel campo non solo della linguistica ma anche eh, dei diritti civili e in generale dell'attivismo politico e quindi eh, quello che vorrei fare è immediatamente entrare in media stress e poter condividere con lui delle riflessioni sul linguaggio ascoltando il suo parere. Hello Noam. Uh, Good it's to very see you. Nice. It's very nice to see you eventually. We should have been together many months ago, but something has blocked this, but we will go on. Um, if you like, I would like to start with something that really struck me when back in the last century I was your student at MIT in 1988, um, you proposed us um, a thought by Joshua Bar Hillel. And I would like to read it because by that time, the, um, that thought was shocking to me, but I still think that it has some value and a powerful, uh, interesting um, source of reflection. If you don't mind, I will just read it for you. Um, it talks about the atmosphere and the um, uh, and the ideas circulating at the uh, laboratory at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He said the following thing. There was a ubiquitous and overwhelming feeling around the laboratory that with the new insight of cybernetics and the newly developed techniques of information theory, the final breakthrough towards full understanding or the complexities of communication in the animal and in a machine had been achieved. Linguists and psychologists, philosophers and sociologists alike hailed the entrance of the electrical engineer and the probability mathematician into the communication field. And I would like you, after so many years, to give me your thoughts, to give us your thought about this. Well, as You remember that Bar Halil was saying that that euphoria was misplaced, that it hadn't happened. Uh, he would, he's referring to the situation in the early 1950s. That's actually when Morris Halley, Eric Lenneberg, and I were just getting together as meeting as grad students at uh, Harvard, graduate students at Harvard. And that was, in fact, the uh, atmosphere at Harvard uh, in the Cambridge environment. Uh, there was a lot of uh, excitement about, uh, it, it was against a socio-political socio background. You have to recall that before the Second World War, the United States was kind of an intellectual backwater. If you wanted to study physics, you would go to Germany. Want to study philosophy, go to England. You want to be a writer, you go to France. Uh, the United States was kind of like uh, some small town off in the periphery. I mean, there were things happening, great scientists, but it was at the margins. Uh, the war changed all that totally. Uh, Europe was, of course, devastated. Uh, the United States gained enormously through the war. Uh, industrial production quadrupled, a lot of wartime disco scientific discoveries during the buildup for the war, and the United States was basically owning the world. You know, so this seeped into general consciousness. Uh, the Europeans were finished. We're taking over. It's, uh, uh, and it was against that background that the new developments that Uh, Bar Halil was describing uh, came to the fore and they 
uh, became part of a feeling that we're really going forward. We're leaving the old world behind. Now we're starting on a new path far beyond what anyone else can see if this showed up in all kinds of domains, including this. Now it happened to be centered at Cambridge, Harvard and MIT. Uh, Claude Shannon's information theory had come, been developed uh, during the wartime. Uh, cybernetics, Norman Wiener cybernetics, uh, looked as if a new era was coming. Uh, we could now turn to the study of what used to be called in old fashioned days, the study of mind. But now we will deal with it by the methods of science. And there was, there was enormous excitement. Uh, I should say that it's pretty similar today uh, with the enthusiasm and excitement about artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning, uh, somehow that's going to solve all the problems. And it's equally built on sand. It will all collapse because it's not getting anything. But this is very similar. And I should mention that at the time, around 1950, there was another source, independent source of enthusiasm and euphoria. That was American structural linguistics, which in fact wasn't represented in Cambridge. There were no American linguists there, which is probably the only one that was my undergraduate background. Uh, Roman Jakobsen was there from the European structuralist tradition, but no American structuralist. But elsewhere in the country, there was a fairly tightly knit group of structural linguists who uh, had uh, accomplished a good deal, but uh, felt that, uh, if you read back at the material then, felt that they had really finally managed to establish linguistics as a science, a taxonomic science, it was called, for the first time. And uh, they had procedures of analysis, which you could were well defined. You could apply to any language, any materials. You get the phonemic analysis, the morphology, a couple of words about syntax, but it was basically done. And in fact, I, I recall as a student at the time that the feeling among the students was this is a lot of fun, but what are we going to do when we apply the procedures to every language? Then it'll be over. And that was the general assumption. So there were two separate uh, kinds of consensus, each enthusiastic and uh, uh, the, the, with a sense that there had been great accomplishments. Uh, now we were basically, in one case, we feel it was finished, and the other we're going to on to a new world. Uh, it all fell apart in the 1950s, and neither worked. It was possible to where the the Cambridge consensus, when it was possible, when the proposals were clear enough, so that you could investigate them precisely, like the idea that uh, language was a uh, Markovian system of uh, production, and which was precise, so you could prove that it's false. Uh, others were less kind of vaguer; you could just give arguments that they were false. The structuralist consensus you can show just didn't work. There was a sharp distinction which became more and more prominent between procedures of analysis, which is what the field was about, and explanatory theories. What turned out is that if you tried to develop an explanatory theory, which is what a generative grammar is, if you tried to construct a generative grammar, an explanatory theory, the elements in it the minimal elements in it could not be reached by the procedures. So there was a gulf between trying to develop an explanation of phenomena of language and applying procedures, they were inconsistent. And what finally prevailed over time was the effort to find explanatory theories. But it's striking to see that we are in a very similar situation today. The excitement coming out from Silicon Valley, basically, lots of hype and 
propaganda about how amazing the achievements are has a certain similarity to the technological euphoria that or Halil was describing and that again by the time he described it he thought had been undermined it was a mistake um the fact that uh, you are referring to that passage that look back at the 50s as still important warns us against the euphoria today but there is one fact that i would like you to reflect on another input you gave us in class was the original work that came from a totally different field it is brain studies and you first introduce us to the work of Lenneberg with the biological foundation of language do you think that there has been any real substantive change in brain studies uh, comparing the 50s to these days oh it's totally different in the uh... Actually, there was interesting work in the field of brain sciences in the early 50s. But interestingly, it was essentially unknown in the areas of psychology, cognitive science, and so on. I'll give you a very striking example of that. Uh, Carl Lashley, one of the great neuroscientists, in around 1950, to 1948, I gave a very important lecture, Hickson Symposium lecture, came out in print in 1951, in which he demonstrated, not by, not by brain studies, but just by looking at the nature of behavior of organisms, a horses galloping, uh, uh, people playing music, and so on that the entire behaviorist framework was hopeless. He showed that it simply took, couldn't possibly work for even simple things like explaining how a horse can gallop. I gave very strong arguments. You have to recall that at that time, radical behaviorism was the center of the euphoric approaches. Uh, B.F. Skinner's uh, William James lectures had appeared in 1948, uh, later came out as his book, Verbal Behavior. Uh, Van Quine, the most influential philosopher at the time, picked it up and it was the core of his work. And it was the, the center. The center of the sense that we can understand everything was radical behaviorism. Lashley in 1951 knocked the profits out from under it. Nobody knew it. I, I discovered it as a student because it was recommended to me by an art historian, mm. Meyer Shapiro, who was kind of a polymath, mentioned to me once that I should look at this article. He thought it was interesting. About 1955, I guess. I looked at it. I could see right away it shattered everything. None of the psychologists at Harvard knew it. It's not mentioned in the literature. In the neurological literature, it's mentioned there it was noticed. Never made it into psychology or cognitive science. I think the first mention of it was probably in my review of Skinner in 1959. Yeah. Later, it came to be noted. But that was the brain sciences. It was important work, but it didn't enter into the field. Of course, there was other work like Wilder Penfield's uh, studies of uh, invasive studies of the brain, studies that can't be carried out now for the ethical reasons, but the bars were pretty much down in those days that were no constraints. But, uh, and then Eric Lenneberg's book came along in 1968, which was really revolutionary. He founded the modern biology of language, and he had very interesting studies of on many different topics, including a, a very interesting chapter on evolution of language, yeah. which to this day remains a classic important basis for going on. Uh, he studied the cases of language disability. So people with virtually no cortex, 
and virtually undetectable cortex who had uh, perfect language knowledge. Uh, how could that be? And uh, uh, actually, he made some interesting discoveries which were so considered so impossible he wouldn't even publish them. But we were we were personal friends, students together in the early fifties. He was already interested in how language developed with uh, disabilities. So one of the things he was interested in was language of the deaf. At that time, there was a very strict oralist tradition. The deaf were not allowed to learn sign. They had to learn lip reading. So parents were instructed not to gesture to your, if you had a deaf child. The schools taught solely lip reading. Uh, Eric went to observe in the main, the most advanced school for the deaf in the Boston area, the Fernald School. And he noticed something very interesting. The teacher was teaching the, the kids with lip reading. But as soon as the uh, teacher turned to the blackboard, the kids started going like this. And he realized they must have invented their own sign language. But that idea was considered so outlandish and outrageous that he never even published. In much later years, it has been discovered that children do indeed invent their own sign language without inputs. But this was, he was 60 years too early, couldn't even publish it. But uh, the book was really a breakthrough. However, the techniques weren't yet available to carry out really effective work in the neurosciences that could bear on serious questions of how language works. And the first breakthrough was, I guess it was 1993, were experiments in, in uh, uh, Milan, which uh, were the first ones up to this day, almost the only ones that found a really significant uh, basis in the functioning of the brain for fund a fundamental property of language, and the, the property that's called structure dependence. A very curious feature of language is that young children, two-year-old children, uh, when they're applying linguistic rules to create and interpret sentences, ignore a hundred percent of what they hear and pay attention only to something that they never hear. What they ignore is the linear order of words. That's what you hear. Like if you listen to us now, you hear words coming along like beads and string one after another. Children totally ignore that, ignore it totally. What they pay attention to is the structures that they're creating in their minds, which of course you never hear. You don't hear a structure. It's just something that your mind automatically creates on the basis of linear order. Now there's substantial linguistic evidence for this, but your experiments, which I'll hand it over to you to talk about, showed you can actually find what's going on in the brain that correlates with this. So why don't you take over? I have to thank you for this. Actually, um, you know, the, the experiment that Noam is describing is the one um, that I've done with three different groups. And in fact, the first one in Milano in, um, in many years ago, actually. Uh, it, the idea was to invent two types of languages. One that was only based on linear order. For example, if you want to negate a sentence, you just put the negation as a third word of the sentence or a fixed position in the sentence. And the other is to use the typical structure that humans use that is not based on linear order, but on hierarchical computation. And we ended up finding that uh, the network, that the brain is able to recognize only those rules that are based on hierarchy as linguistic rules. The other are treated by the brain as logical puzzles as something different. But I have to say that all these experiments didn't come out of the blue. I mean, it was very easy for me 
and my group to design the experiment by taking seriously your first papers of the 50s, the one that you just mentioned, uh, where it was clear by using mathematical theorems, not just you know, um, uh, approximate self-intuition or, you know, uh, ex exoteric ideas that Markovian chains were not able to capture the basic property of human languages. And nowadays, as you know, because we've discussed this together, the new challenge will be to shift from what I used to call the where problem, that is where in the brain a certain circuit is active. So for example, the circuit that pertains to language as opposed to other activities to the what problem. So it is what is the actual information the neuron passed to the other. But again, without a linguistic theory in the back, um, as a background, you cannot even start doing this. It's not big. In this case, the, the famous fancy um, expression big data doesn't count. It would be as capturing the fact that the, the sun is... Uh, fix and we rotate along it by, you know, taking 2,000 trillion pictures of the sun out of the window. It doesn't come like that. So I think that all the experiments that can be done, especially about syntax, which is the core of human language, it can only be done if we take these generative procedures, this explanatory force that you design in the 50s as, um, as a possible guideline. But following again your reflection on the danger of a new kind of reductionism, I would like you to share with us your reflection on another extremely interesting thought that I've been exposed to by, uh, to, by you, that is the following. You, um, in class, I remember you talked out about the notion of gravity. And during the Cartesian time, people were, since, you know, it was not possible to assume action at distance, that the moon was trapped into a vortex and had to rotate along uh, around the Earth. But then Newton came about with our different ideas. I would like you to expand your own reflection on this, because to me, they do really represent the challenge that neuroscience is facing today, similar to that of those times. Well, there is a little bit of a background, so let me go back another century. Uh, there's a certain similarity between the uh, kind of euphoria that, that Orhaleo was describing, that of the consensus of linguists, of uh, the big data euphoria today, the sense that we haven't answered everything. Okay. That was true of the 16th century, the neo-scholastic uh, period. Uh, neo-scholastic physics had, had a lot of a lot of results, accounted for, described a lot of things very well, but it hadn't answered everything. If you wanted to know, say, if I'm uh, holding a a cup in my hand and it has boiling water in it, and I drop it, I let my hand go, the cup falls to the ground, the steam rises to the earth. So they had an answer. They're moving to their natural place. The cup is moving to the earth, which is the natural place for a solid object. Steam is going to the heavens, a natural place for gas. Uh, if two objects attract or repel each other, that's because they have sympathies and antipathies. Uh, if uh, you look at a tri, if you look at the figure of a triangle, uh, and you see a triangle, the reason is that the form of the triangle moves through the air, uh, gets into your eye, and implants itself in the brain. So you have an answer to that problem. And in fact, there were kinds of answers to almost everything, uh, much like the structuralist period, the you know, Markovian information theoretic period and so on. Uh, Galileo and his contemporaries achieved something extremely significant. They were able to be puzzled. They said, thought, wait a minute, these 
descriptions are based on what they came to call occult ideas, ideas that really have no substance. Like the idea back in the 50s that was rampant that uh, language is a matter of training and habit. Leonard Bloomfield, the great American linguist, uh, others believe the same thing. It's just children are trained with thousands of examples, millions of examples, and somehow it, the habit is formed and they know what to say next. And you start thinking about it, it's completely inconceivable. Well, Galileo and his contemporaries took the same position towards the neo-scholastic science. They said, none of this makes any sense. And they started to do what in fact were thought experiments. Galileo never carried out most of his experiments. And if he had, they, they wouldn't have worked because the equipment was too primitive. He worked out what must happen. So he didn't drop balls off the Tower of Pisa. He worked through a very intelligent thought experiment which showed that if he had a heavy, big lead, heavy lead ball and a small lead ball, they'd have to fall at the same time. Mm -hmm. Good argument for it. This didn't cut much ice with the funders at the time, the aristocrats, the National Science Foundation. They couldn't understand why anyone would study a ball rolling down a frictionless plane, something that doesn't even exist when he could be studying something interesting like the growth of flowers or the sunset or something like that. So it was a hard job to try to convince them that, look, it's worth getting to these very simple things. If you have a, a, a ball on the top of the mast of a sailboat and the sailboat is moving along, why does the ball fall to the mat, the bottom of the mast? Why doesn't it fall to the back of the mast? back behind because the sailboat's moving forward. Notice that's an experiment you could never carry out because if you tried to carry it out, the ball would fall all over the place. Yeah. But um, he showed just by thought experiments that yes, this is the reason why it's going to fall to the base. And that's how modern science developed. But it developed in an interesting way. The new scientists, Galileo and the rest, wanted to have a serious explanation and what they came up with was what was called the mechanical philosophy. Now, this was in part stimulated by something that was happening in Europe at the time. Uh, skilled artisans at the time were creating very complex art, uh, artifacts, complex uh, clocks that did all sorts of things, uh, uh, acting out plays with uh, uh, figures that were artificial, that looked almost real. The gardens at Versailles, where you walk through the gardens and, you know, things were popping up for you and so on. Uh, the world was just, Europe was full of uh, something that, uh, a model of a duck digesting, which was Vaucanson's, one of his models. All of this suggested that maybe the world is just a big example of a machine. Just as an artisan can construct these incredible machines which fool us into believing they're alive, so a master artisan created the entire world as a complex machine. Now, I think there's an open question that could be studied today. My guess is that this is intuitive, our intuitive innate understanding of the world. So for example, there was these famous experiments by Michat back, I think in the 1940s, where he showed that if you present a child with two bars, uh, which are not quite touching and one of them moves and the other moves, the child will automatically assume that there's a hidden connection between them. And uh, that the, in general, the mind kind of creates a mechanical explanation for whatever it sees happening mm -hmm. intuitively. And I suspect that investigation might demonstrate that the mechanical philosophy, as it was called, is just our intuitive sense of the world, uh, fortified by what was happening with the uh, 
development of complex artifacts. A philosophy, of course, meant science at the time. It was mechanical science. Uh, this was picked up by Descartes, as you mentioned, a great scientist who try, thought he could demonstrate that the world was indeed a machine. Interestingly, he found one aspect of the world that wouldn't work like a machine, language. He said it's impossible to construct a machine that will produce expressions the way we normally do uh, that are appropriate to situations but are not caused by them. They're, as the Cartesians put it, they're, uh, we are inclined, incited and inclined to speak the way we do, but not impelled. We can act creatively and in our just normal behavior, create new thoughts, new expressions that others can hear. Actually, Galileo and the uh, mainly the Port Royal uh, linguists, uh, logicians, uh, noticed the same thing in a different way. Uh, they expressed their awe and amazement at the fact that it seemed mir miraculous and in some ways still does that with just a few symbols, you can construct infinitely many thoughts and you can convey to others who have no access to your mind, mm -hmm. inner workings of your mind. Uh, how is this miracle possible? Or a problem of the study of language, 17th study. And so Descartes and Galileo, Arno, others recognize that language is somehow out of this language and thought, but the rest of the world is a machine. And Isaac Newton came along. He was puzzled by Descartes' vortex theory, the theory of how things interact. A uh, second volume of Principia is devoted to demonstrating that it doesn't work. So what are we left with? Things attract each other and repel each other, but there's no contact. Uh, Newton regarded this as what he called an absurdity that no person with any scientific knowledge could contemplate. Uh, the other great scientists of the day just dismissed it. Uh, Leibniz uh, said, this is ridiculous. Nothing can, how could this conceivably be the case? So Christian Huygens, great experimentalist, was dismissed nonsense, just reinventing occult ideas. But Newton actually agreed. He said, yes, it's like the occult ideas, but there's one yeah. difference. I have a theory that explains things using these ideas. Now, he never called his work uh, philosophy of physics or anything like that. Philosophy meant science. He just called it mathematical, a mathematical theory. Mm -hmm. The reason was he, as he put it, I have no explanations. His famous comment about, I make no hypotheses was in that context. He said, I have no physical explanation. I'm not going to make a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I can't sure what it is. And that's where it was left with Newton. Well, what happened after that, in fact, the, a mechanical model provided the criterion of intelligibility for Galileo, Leibniz, Newton, great founders of modern science. If you didn't have a mechanical model, it wasn't intelligible. So Galileo was dissatisfied with any theory of the tides because you couldn't construct a mechanical model for it. But what happened after Newton is sort of interesting. Science just abandoned the hope for intelligible theories. The theories are intelligible, but what they describe is not intelligible. So Newton's theory was intelligible. Leibniz could understand that. He couldn't understand what it described. That was unintelligible. Post, it took a long time, but post-Newton science just slowly abandon the search for an intelligible world. The world is whatever it is. The most we can hope for is intelligible theories. And it took on a new different form with Kant and with others. But essentially science lowered its goals. 
So if we can get an intelligible theory of something, that's as far as we can go. We're not going to try to penetrate further. The goals of the great founders of modern science were abandoned. It did take time. So for example, in Cambridge, Newton's University, uh, after his death, I think it was about half a century before they even started teaching his theories, because they weren't real science, they were just mathematical. Now this goes on into the 20th century in interesting ways. So take chemistry and physics. Uh, chemistry was not reducible to physics. So, uh, and chemistry was described as, was considered just a mode of calculating experiments, the results of experiments. Uh, into the 1920s, uh, great Nobel laureates in physics and chemistry were describing chemistry as a mode of calculation. It's not a real science because you can't reduce it to physics. Uh, take uh, Bertrand Russell, who knew the sciences very well, 1928 wrote that chemistry is not yet reduced to physics. Maybe it will be someday, but we haven't gotten that far yet. It's kind of like when people say today, uh, mental processes are not yet reduced to neural processes. We'll get there. Well, what happened with chemistry and physics? Quantum revolution came along. Turned out that physics was wrong. Chemistry could not be reduced to physics because chemistry was right and physics was wrong. It came along with a new physics. You know, then you could unify, not reduce. You could unify yes. pretty much unchanged chemistry with physics, uh, with the new physics. So Dirac gave a quantum theoretic account yeah. of chemical properties. Uh, Linus Pauling gave a quantum theoretic account of the chemical bond. And then you had a unified system, but no reduction. In fact, chemistry was not reducible to physics. Well, let's come to today. Mm. It may very well turn out uh, the neurosciences have made progress, but they're nowhere near advanced as physics was in the yeah. It's impossible. It's much too complex. Uh, but it might very well turn out that looking for reduction is the wrong way to go. Yes. That just as you couldn't reduce the world to the mechanical models and you couldn't reduce chemistry to physics because the base for the reduction was wrong, might turn out that it's the neurosciences, the brain sciences that will have to be reconsidered in different ways if we're going to be able to unify them with what we discover about the nature of language, thought, cognition, and so on. And I think there's some indication that that might be true. I'm thinking particularly of Randy Gallisel's work, a uh, very significant uh, friend of ours, who's a great cognitive neuroscientist, has been arguing for some years with increasing resonance in the field that neural nets are simply the wrong technique for trying to calculate. And actually, Helmholtz back in the 19th century or had some reasons to believe this. The neural nets are slow. The neural transmission, of course, it's you know, fast by my standards, but slow by the standards of what the brain has to do. And furthermore, as Gallisel's demonstrated pretty well, I think, with neural nets, you just cannot construct the minimal computational element that's needed for the basic theory of computation, Turing computability, basically the way your computer works. The basic unit that's involved in computation can't be constructed out of neural nets. So there must be something else, probably at the cellular level, where there's that more computing power maybe an RNA, a turtle to the cell, a microtubule or something there. So it may be that the whole of, and incidentally, the neural nets are the basis for the deep learning models. Now they're kind of modeled on neural nets. They're probably just looking in the wrong place, mm -hmm. which is why everything is done basically by brute force, mm -hmm. massive brute force. But so you get mm -hmm. things that kind of look, look 
exciting, like the artifacts that were constructed by artisans in the 16th, 17th century were exciting, but going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. you know, that's uh, very, very likely to be true in my opinion. I don't know what you think about the neurosciences. That it's the lack of reduction is because the base system hasn't hasn't worked itself out properly. Yet. Yeah. When it does, we may find real unification. Yeah, um, this is a I mean a, a, such an exhaustive and illuminating synthesis that I'm left with two observations and one question. The two observations are very small. I just picked up because I I remember this kind of methodological suggestion you gave us. The first one concerns one thing that you just uh, put in your discourse without underlying it. That is something you wrote back in when you wrote the Managua lectures. And actually, I dare underline it when you gave your talk in the Vatican. Uh, there is an expression of yours that has been one of the fundamental things in my own personal life, but of all the students you had, you, you once said, it is important to be surprised by simple facts. And I think that is a, an overwhelming indication of methodology in science. You don't really need to get too far to get a good questions. I mean, the Gedanken experiment that you cited from Galileo, down to the one of general relativity by Albert Einstein had the same flavor. Be surprised about simple things. And the second thing that um, I would like to highlight of your synthesis is that at a certain point you said, it is impossible to construe a machine that talks. Uh, obviously, I cannot but agree, but there is one important thing that I used to highlight everywhere I give talks and I speech, there is a fundamental distinction between simulate and comprehend the actual uh, functioning. It's of course very useful that you have tools which we can interact with by quote unquote speaking, but it's certainly clear that those simulation cannot uh, be used to understand what really goes on in the brain of a child when she or he grows and gets uh, her or his grammar. But beside this extremely important things, there's one thing that I would like, a final question I would like to, to ask you. Uh, the way that you depict the relationship between chemistry and physics in the history of science um, allows us to reflect about the role of linguistics and neuroscience my personal view that doesn't count, obviously, and I, that's what I want to ask you, is that linguistics cannot be must not be ancillary to what we know about the brain. But if anything, we have to change with, and go toward perhaps a unification, provided that we dare use the term mystery in the way that you use. That is, it's not excluded that humans may never be understand to one. Uh, may never end up understanding creativity, but just the boundaries of Babel, that is <laughs> the the range of possibilities that our brain offers when it comes to language. If it makes sense, I would like you to, to comment a little on this. I'm a kind of minority. The two of us are a minority. <laughs> that it may indeed be a mystery. Uh, I think we can Let's go back. Let's take a look at, say, rats, okay, some other organism. You can train a rat to run pretty complicated mazes. You're never going to train a rat to run a prime number maze, a maze that says turn right at every prime number. The reason is the rat just doesn't have that concept, and there's no way to give it that concept. It's out of the conceptual range of a rat. That's true of every organism. Why shouldn't it be true of us? I mean, are we some kind of angels? You know, why shouldn't we have the same uh, basic nature as other organisms? In fact, it's very hard to th think how we cannot be like that. Take our capacities. I mean, take our capacity uh, to run uh, 100 meters. We have that capacity because we cannot fly. Mm 
I mean, the ability to do something entails the lack of ability to do something else. Mm. I mean, we have the ability because we're somehow constructed so that we can do it. Mm. But that same design that's enabling us to do one thing is preventing us from doing something else. That's true in every domain of uh, existence. Why shouldn't it be true of cognition? We're capable of developing, uh, say, humans, or not me, but humans are capable of developing, say, advanced quantum theory based on certain properties of their mind. And those very same properties may be preventing them from doing something else. In fact, I think we have examples of this, plausible examples. I take the, the fact, the crucial moment in science where scientists abandoned the hope for getting to an intelligible world. That was discussed at the time. David Hume, great philosopher, his, uh, his history of England, wrote a huge history of England. There's a chapter devoted to Isaac Newton, full chapter. He describes Newton as you know the greatest mind that ever developed and so on and so forth. And he said, Newton's great achievement was to uh, draw the veil away from some of the mysteries of nature, namely his theory of universal gravitation and so on, but to leave other mysteries uh, a cover, a, in, a hidden in ways which we will never understand, referring to what's the world like, we'll never understand it. He yeah. said he left that as a permanent mystery. Well, as far as we know, he was right. And there are other permanent mysteries. So, for example, uh, Descartes and others were, when they were considering that mind is separate from body, notice that that theory fell apart because the theory of body was wrong. But okay. the theory of mind might well have been right. But one of the things they were concerned with was just a voluntary action. Mm -hmm decide to lift your finger. Nobody knows. To this day, we haven't a clue. Mm. How, uh, the great scientists who work on voluntary motion, uh, one of them is uh, Emilio Bizzi, is one of MIT, yeah. great scientists, one of the leading scientists who works on voluntary motion. He recently uh, wrote a kind of state-of-the-art mm -hmm. article Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, in which he describes what they've discovered about controlling motion. He says, he says he'll put the outcome fancifully, is his word. It's as if we are coming to understand the puppet and the strings. Yes. We know nothing about the puppeteer. It remains as yeah. much a mystery as it has been since classical Greece, not an inch of progress nothing. Well, maybe that's another permanent mystery. Yes. I'm still, you know, there's a lot of arguments saying, oh, it can't be true. You know, everything's deterministic and so on, all sorts of claims. Nobody believes it. In your, in your heart, you don't believe it, even if you give the argument, because it just makes no sense. I know perfectly well that I can decide to lift my finger. I don't care what he says. But, just in case, but, but, science tells anything about it. Yeah. Science tells us it doesn't fall within science. Okay. <laughs> wrong with science? You know, the science deals with things that are determined or random. That was understood in the 17th century. Still true today. Yeah. You can have a science of things that are random, of things that are determined. You have no science of voluntary action. Just as you have no science of the creativity of language. Yes. Similar thing. Are they permanent mysteries? Could be. Could be that it's just something we will never comprehend. In that case, what we should, you could say the same about some aspects of consciousness. Uh, when I, what does it mean for me to look at the background uh, that I see here and see something red? What's my feeling of red? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can explain, you know, what the sensory organs are doing and 
what's going on in the brain, but it doesn't capture the sense of something being read. Will we ever capture it? Maybe not. Maybe just something that's uh, beyond their cognitive capacities. Uh, that shouldn't really surprise mm -hmm. us if we are organic creatures, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, it's certainly a possibility. So the be maybe the best we can do is what science did after Newton, construct intelligible theories. Yes. So try to construct the best theory we can about consciousness or uh, voluntary action or creative use of language or whatever we're talking about, the miracle that so amazed Galileo mm -hmm. and Arnaud about the, and it still surprise, amazes me, I can't understand it. How can we with a few symbols convey to others the inner workings of our mind? That's something to really be surprised about and puzzled by. And we have some grasp of it, but not a lot. Uh, some of this, if you read the, when I started doing, working on history of linguistics, which had been totally forgotten, nobody knew about it. Uh, I discovered all sorts of things like these. Yeah. But one of the things I came across was uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt's very interesting work. Uh, one part of it has become famous, this sentence that uh, we have that language makes infinite use of finite means. It's thought that we've answered that question with Turing computability and generative grammar, but we haven't. He was talking about infinite use, mm. not the generative capacity. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can understand the generation of the expressions that we use, mm -hmm. but we don't understand how we use them. Mm -hmm. Why do we decide to say this at one state point and not say something else? Mm -hmm. Why do, in our normal interactions, why do we convey the inner workings of our minds to others in a particular way? And nobody understands that. Mm -hmm. So the infinite use of language remains as much of a mystery as it always was. This sentence, this aphorism is constantly misunderstood. At least as linguists, we could go on doing what you once told us, that uh, using a slogan by a, um, a French Nobel Award in physics, that we have to reduce what is visible and complex into what is invisible and simple. We, yeah. That's what we need to do. Now, uh, the time has gone. Uh, let me thank you for this extremely interesting chat. I, I feel a form of nostalgia for not being there, but in the name of all the organizer of the Festival of Literatura di Manto by the public, let me thank you so much for all you said at the time you dedicated to us. This was a, a great moment. Thank you so much. Pleasure, wonderful to talk to you. To take off.